finally we come to where they are. They're leaving Bethlehem. They're going, I'm sorry, Bethel, and they're going down to Bethlehem. And on the way down there, 20 years earlier, Jacob had gone up to Padam Aran to find a wife. And when he stopped in Bethel, he was tired, and he took a rock, and he slept on the rock, and he had visions of God, a ladder reaching up to heaven, and angels ascending and descending on it. And this was fulfilled in the Christ himself when he said, and he said to him, speaking to Nathanael in the first chapter of John, most assuredly I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. All in one paragraph. An obscure birth of a boy and a death of a mother. All of that is revealed and more that I could do, that I could tell you about today. And this is what we do, just so you know, if anybody is looking for something to do on Monday morning, we have a Bible study right over here, and we talk about these things. We search the scriptures together to find these things. And we do the same thing on Saturday afternoon at 4.30, we meet together. So if anybody's interested in finding things like this in the Bible, they're there. There's thousands of them. God revealing to us his son, Jesus Christ, in the pages of the Bible. And instead, we play Farmville on Facebook. Here are a couple more accounts in the Old Testament which are much less veiled concerning the coming Christ, and yet there is veiled information in them. These are prophecies telling us specifically about the things of Jesus, his birth and his ministry. From the book of Micah, we read the very spot where the Lord would be born. This prophecy was so specific in what it was saying. The King Herod, when he went to the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees, he said, where is this child going to be born? And they went right to this passage. Out of the thousands and thousands of verses in the scriptures, he said, this is where it's going to be. It's going to be in Bethlehem. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are old from everlasting. Now, this prophecy was about the Lord Jesus and where he would be born, where he was ushered into the world in which he created. And then another very specific prophecy comes only days before we usher him out of the world. The very beings that he created shouted for joy as he rode into Jerusalem. And five days later, they nailed him to a tree. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. The word there, having salvation, is the word yesha. It's the root of the word yeshua. So here's Jesus having salvation, riding on a donkey. There is the explicit and then hidden in the explicit are wondrous mysteries, just waiting for you to discover. The probability that Jesus could have filled, fulfilled eight of such prophecies would be one in 10 to the 17th power. In his book, Science Speaks, Peter Stoner says, if you had that many silver dollars, one in the 17th power, it would be enough to cover the entire state of Texas two feet deep with silver dollars. One to the 17th power. 270,000 square miles of land covered two feet deep in silver dollars, and you'd have to walk over, put your hand in without looking, and pull out the correct one. That's if eight were fulfilled. Liberal scholars that deny the greatness of Jesus Christ have to admit 60. Alfred Adersheim, the 19th century theologian, has a list of 456. The silver dollars at that power of magnitude would fill the entire universe and there'd be change left over for Slurpees for eternity. I'm not kidding. That is the greatness of our God. And Alfred Adersheim's 456, I tell you, we found how many in one paragraph of the Old Testament. There are thousands of them, thousands. The magnitude would go on, and it does go on forever, the greatness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, we have to stop here with types and pictures because there are so many we would never get to point to. But what I would like you to remember is that when you read the Bible, you ask yourself, how does this point to Jesus? Point number two today is the hypostatic union, the God-man. The term hypostatic union goes all the way back to a guy named Apollinarius of Laodicea in AD 390. It's been worked on, it's been amended, it's been debated over that time. 
but since then it is a way of describing the union of man with God in the person of Jesus Christ. Two hyposes, or two states, in the person, the hypostatic union. Concerning the basis for Jesus' deity, you cannot deny the virgin birth and come up with that. In fact, the two are absolutely inseparable. Larry King questioned one time. He said, I would like to ask him if he was indeed virgin born, because the answer to that question would define history. Well, I'm sorry for Larry, but we're not going to get a chance to answer that question. He is in heaven, and we are on earth, and God has given us his word, and we stand or we fall by what his word states. This is what God expects, not just some arrogant demand, but the humility of accepting his word at face value about the person and work of Jesus Christ. God looks for faithfulness in his faithless creatures. So I want you to know that a little bit will do. Peter Larson showed faith. He said, despite our efforts to keep him out, God intrudes. The life of Jesus is bracketed by two impossibilities, a virgin's womb and an empty tomb. Jesus entered our world through a door marked no entrance, and he left our world through a door marked no exit. So let's talk about the incarnation of Jesus Christ. What is it about this particular subject that makes, and I mean this, it makes my head hurt. Of all the thinking I do on the person of Jesus Christ, this is the one area that I cannot get my mind around. God uniting with human flesh, it takes me to the point of mental exhaustion. And so, this is the truth, when I can't sleep, I think about it and it puts me to sleep. It never fails to do so. Not because of boredom, but because it simply pushes everything else out and it just puts me to sleep. Peaceful sleep from a wonderful Savior. The virgin birth means that Jesus was born into humanity through Mary, but he re retained his deity from the Father, the God-man. So when we ponder questions about Jesus, one question must, in almost every circumstance, give two answers. Could Jesus weep? As God, no. As man, yes. Could Jesus learn? As God, no. As man, he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men. Could Jesus suffer? As God, no. As man, yes. Could Jesus die? As God, no. As man, he did. Could Jesus sin? As God, no. As man, people debate that one. Some say yes, some say no. The, big, the debate is there, and hotheads love to debate over it. But regardless of the truth of that question, in the end, he didn't. We serve a perfect Savior. And the term incarnation, which is the basis for the hypostatic union, comes from the words in and carn, meaning flesh, carnal. God united with humanity and walked among us, and yet Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. He is the divine logos, the word of God, who took upon these robes of flesh, being born of a virgin. He did not possess humanity before the conception, and yet there are mysteries about his appearances in the Old Testament. No matter his state since then, since his conception, he is clothed with humanity forever in this hypostatic union. He's not bound by the human nature. He remains fully God, and yet his nature, his God and his humanity, in no way intermingle, and yet they're in no way separate. He has all the attributes of man, a human genealogy. He aged and increased in knowledge. He prayed, he got hungry, he got tired, he felt compassion, wept. He was thirsty. Many times, more than a hundred in fact, he is called the son of man or the son of David, indicating his human nature and so on. And yet he has all the attributes of God. He is the creator and sustainer of all things. He has eternality. He has omnipresence as he indicated at his ascension. He has omniscience as he recorded in the book of John. He has omnipotence, as he stated himself at the Great Commission. He is immutable. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He performs the work of God, such as raising the dead, 
Over 40 times he is called the Son of God, indicating his divine nature, and so on. So let's define the hypostatic union, and then we'll move on. Jesus Christ is fully God, deity, uniting with full humanity, without intermingling or separation in these qualities. In him there is no change or division of any kind, completely and forever. He is the finite, united with the infinite, the point where God fellowships with man. Yes, he is full deity, and yes, he is full humanity. As I said, when we ask a question about Jesus Christ, we need to give two answers. Could Jesus suffer? As a man, he did suffer. And that brings me to point number three, the servant who suffered. Howard Hendricks said of Jesus, there was no identity crisis in the life of Jesus Christ. He knew who he was, he knew where he had come from, and why he was here. And he knew where he was going. And when you were that liberated, you can serve. And again, Clement of Alexandria said, the Lord ate from a common bowl and asked his disciples to sit on the grass. He washed their feet with a towel wrapped around his waist. He who is the Lord of the whole universe. In Matthew 20, we read these words, And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Jesus did come to serve. Mark's gospel in particular is a gospel of his servanthood. But along with his serving came suffering. He gave his life as a ransom for many. Now, suffering is one of those things that we that we human beings simply have to put up with. We suffer through boring sermons. <laughs> we suffer when we stub our toe. We suffer at the loss of family or friends or even a treasured family pet. We are tied into this physical world and we have no choice in that. That restraint brings on suffering. And whether we like it or not, we are here and we do suffer. We have no choice in the matter. And so I'd ask, how many of you personally had to make unpleasant choices? I can either do this or I can do that. Maybe it involves something really, really unpleasant, like voting for McCain or voting for Obama. But you knew you had to make the right choice, and so you voted for either him or you voted for him. Either way, you knew you had to do the right thing. Maybe it's something even more difficult, like being able to afford a present for your child or paying your electricity bill. I, I don't know. We have choices to make, but these choices aren't really suffering. In fact, we might have to face choices about suffering at some point. Do I accept chemotherapy or do I take my chances? One way or another, we are going to suffer, either from the medicine or we're going to suffer from not knowing when we're going to die and the pain that comes along with that accepting the medicine. We have a choice about the suffering, but we have no choice in the suffering. But Jesus... Jesus did have a choice. Not only did he come to serve as our Gospels record, but he came to suffer as well. The Creator had a choice, but to demonstrate his greatness and his love, he did something so extraordinary, something so immense that it's just absolutely beyond comprehension. We talk about Jesus' life, and we talk about Jesus' death, and we sing about the wondrous cross, but we don't really consider that it was voluntary. And not only was this voluntary, but he did it for us. Would you go through what Jesus Christ went through for a spider? And I'm absolutely serious about that. Would you? A spider is far, far closer to us than we are to God. Would you suffer or allow your child to suffer? for a maggot 